Huntsman Cancer Institute. I know that some people are very familiar with us, but there may be some of you um, in the group who, who are not aware of us. Um, I'm going to be very quick because I, you didn't come here to listen to me, and I, I fully appreciate that. And uh, just say a few words about us and what we do here, uh, and why events like tonight are so important to us. So, at Huntsman Cancer Institute, we have we have three missions um, which are around cancer, and one of those is treatment. Uh, one of those is research into cancers, and and one of them is is education about cancer, both for professionals who are planning careers in cancer care, and for the public and for patients. So in a way, you know, we, we look at uh, evenings like tonight as bringing all of those things together because I am sure you're going to hear during this evening uh, about new treatments. I'm sure you're going to hear a lot about research and as part of what we do here, you know, our job is to bring some of that information to you. We, we have th um, core values at Huntsman Cancer Institute which we, we try very hard to stick to. Um, and we have three core values that sort of drive what we do. The first of those is the patient first. Um, the second of those is a team effort, united effort. And the third of them is, is excellence in all we do. And the first one, of course, putting our patients first is, is the most important thing we do. That's why we're here. United effort, though, is really important to us because one of the things that we, we've learned um, from, from many years of experience, not just at Huntsman Cancer Institute, but, but everywhere, is that, that that kind of team effort and the idea of a care team is really important to the way that we take care of patients with cancers. And the expertise that you can bring, the broader the expertise that you can bring to bear on any one individual cancer patient is so important to their final outcome. So at the Institute here, we, we arrange all of our care around what we call disease centers. We have meetings where we have a wide range of specialists every week to discuss the care of individual patients so that we get the best possible expertise. Now, even um, uh, we, we have really a remarkable team for patients with, with cancers such as uh, appendix cancer and pseudomyxoma peritonei. But we were extremely fortunate um, a few months ago to bring another whole new expertise um, to the Huntsman in the shape of uh, Dr. Lambert, who is uh, internationally renowned for the work that she does in this area. And she has brought new treatments here. And that team effort is really important for, for, for those types of cancer which are really relatively uncommon where you just can't get that sort of strength of expertise and breadth of expertise in one place everywhere across the country or across the state. So uh, Dr. Lambert's presence here has strengthened an already strong team and so it's an example of us being able to bring new treatments uh, to, to those folks who are affected by cancers. Um, we bring up, we're bringing other new treatments in here. Any of you, some of you may have seen, we're about to start work on a, a proton therapy center here at the Institute. In fact, some of the groundwork for that has just started. We announced last week that um, we're going to be building an extension to our hospital and to our clinics so that we can hopefully take care of more people here. And this all helps us to kind of fulfill our overall mission which is primarily to the state of Utah, but way beyond as well. So like I said, I hope that what you get from this evening is a feeling that what, what really matters um, in taking care of some, uh, well, all types of cancer, but in, in some ways in these uncommon cancers, it's really Im uh, important, is this team effort. And we think of the team effort as everybody, the patient, the physicians, the environmental services people who clean the rooms and prepare the food and so on, they're all part of our team and that's what creates the atmosphere here. So I hope that you're going to have a, a very informative evening and I hope it's going to be enjoyable as well. Um, I want to thank you again all for being here and to everyone who is contributing to this evening, thank you for coming too. I hope you find it worthwhile. I know Dr. Lambert's going to be looking for feedback from you afterwards to what we could do better and what worked really well. 
So thanks again. I really truly hope you find this useful. And uh, without saying any more, I'm going to hand over, I think, to Dr. Lambert to pick up from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sweetenham, and uh, let's see, is this on? There we go, that's a little bit better. I'm gonna try not to yell. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your, for your remarks and to the Huntsman Institute for allowing us to have this uh, symposium tonight. I just want to um, thank uh, some other people as well. Um, in particular, I really wanna thank Joanna Purcell. I think she's still out, is she out there? So Joanna is uh, the administrative assistant that I have the pleasure to work with, and she is just, uh, really, um, as soon as I presented this idea of putting the symposium on to her, she just took it and ran with it. So I am deeply indebted to her. I also want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Lauren Smith from the ACPMP uh, Research Foundation, uh, who is sponsoring our symposium tonight and whose bright orange bags uh, you can you see around you. Uh, she's going to say a few, few words on behalf of uh, the ACPMP Research Foundation which has really been instrumental in raising awareness about appendiceal cancer and pseudomyxoma and also raising funding uh, for research and, um, uh, and, and as well as educating physicians about the disease. Um, I also want to acknowledge some other people who are here tonight uh, who will be available for anybody to talk to uh, afterwards. So we have um, Dr. Jonathan Wisnant, who's gonna be speaking uh, from the medical oncologist perspective as well, and, and he'll be around afterwards to answer some questions. We have Dr. Alfocher <laughs> from Pathology, uh, who also will be available to answer any questions if you have questions related to pathology. Uh, we have people, we will have people from the Wellness Center, as well as one of our social workers, uh, uh, Libby uh, Silverstein, who's going to be here as well. People from a wonderful new program that we have here at the Huntsman called Huntsman at Home uh, to keep the continuity of care and the sense of having that team that Dr. Sweetenham was talking about to follow patients uh, at, to home after they've had surgery or, or other treatments as needed, and uh, they'll be available to answer any questions. We also have a representative from the patient and family housing program for our patients that come from a distance that need assistance in staying locally. Um, we also have um, Brad Bishop is here from the Huntsman Foundation. Uh, and I think that covers it. Other than you probably noticed two gentlemen in scrubs with a big machine uh, out in front. And if you have a chance, stop by and see them. Sam and Jacob from our, our perfusion uh, team are here and they can show you how uh, the perfusion works for this device that we um, use for, uh, for the heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy that we'll talk about a little bit during the presentations tonight. Uh, if anybody needs a bathroom, it's right out this door and off to the, to the right a little bit. Um, and I think uh, with that, we'll move on to uh, Lauren's presentation. Oh, actually, more importantly, most importantly, and uh, what I, this is now my seventh, uh, eighth symposium. Uh, when I was at the University of Massachusetts, we, we put on uh, seven of these prior to this one. The most important thing about this night and the reason for having this symposium is to bring patients and their families together who are dealing with appendiceal cancer, pseudomyxoma, so that you can look around and see that you are not alone. That's really the most important thing. You're not alone. Uh, there are other people who, who are experiencing what you're experiencing. I hope you have a chance to meet each other, talk to each other, share your experiences. There's so much strength and knowledge that comes from that. And also, again, you're not alone because you have this whole team behind you here at the Huntsman, here at the ACPMP Research Foundation. And, and I can attest to the fact that there's a whole community of surgical oncologists who are devoting their life to this to try to, and medical oncologists, I should say, as well, who are devoting their lives to trying to find better treatments and answers and cure uh, for, for appendiceal cancer and pseudomyxoma. So with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, Lauren Smith from the ACPMP Foundation. Have to look up there and you can use the mouse. Oh, okay. Okay, and then you probably can just uh, page down. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Smith, and I'm the Development and Communications Manager with the ACPMP Research Foundation. I myself am also a patient, too, diagnosed last year with low grade mucinous neoplasm. However, due to my age and an early diagnosis, I don't have to pursue treatment at this point in my life. 
I know that not everyone affected by this rare disease is so lucky, so I became involved with ACPMP, first fundraising, and later taking on a full-time role. We are proud to collaborate with the Huntsman Cancer Institute through sponsorship of today's symposium, and I'm excited to share ACPMP's story with you all. The ACPMP Research Foundation is a 501c3 charitable organization. The foundation was created in 2008 by a community of individuals affected by PMP and appendix cancer. The ACPMP Research Foundation is dedicated to funding research to find a cure for PMP and appendix cancer. One goal included raising a minimum of $1 million to fund important research, which was achieved in 2013. Another part of our mission is to play a leading role in education and awareness, providing accurate information to patients and medical communities. This is a list of our current board members who have all been impacted by this disease. Board members volunteer their time after their full-time careers for this cause. ACPMP was originally formed as an all-volunteer organization. However, since celebrating 10 years this past July, ACPMP has taken on its first two dedicated staff members, being myself and Carolyn Lewandowski. We are fortunate to benefit from working with our medical advisory board consisting of outstanding specialists. Our advisory board's guidance and support is critical to our success. This is a diagram of our primary focuses as an organization, research, education, and fundraising, all hoping to lead to a cure. This is a video created for our 10 year anniversary that I want to share with you all.
So fundraising for us is hugely critical in continuing our mission. If you're interested in fundraising, ACPMP can help anyone by creating a dedicated website, helping with registration and marketing the event on your behalf. Fundraising consists of diversified efforts from patients, caregivers, family, to their friends. It's mainly local events um, from pub crawls to basketball tournaments, t-shirt sales to awareness walks. The, another part of fundraising includes memorial and honorary donations and Facebook and online fundraisers. This is one of our big fundraisers that's held every year. It's held annually since 2007 in memory of Dutch Culberson on Father's Day in Pennsylvania. It's called Making a Difference for Dutch, the 12th annual PMP Appendix Cancer Walk. And this year it raised over $40,000 with a total of well over $300,000. This is another event that was recently just held last weekend. In Vermont, an event inspired by and in memory of Barrett Peterson, the Petersons and team hosted a bike race and a walk slash run that raised an astounding $50,000. These are some of our 2017 events, uh, the second annual Bob, Bob Strong Walk, Hoops for a Cure, and Hair Today Gone Tomorrow. These are some of our 2018 events, the annual Team Keith Pub Crawl, the second annual We Believe Breakfast with Santa, and Forever Flowers by Carol. So these are some examples of our online fundraisers, being my own. Um, it's a website that we created last year, basically to educate people, to tell my story and to raise money. And then also Facebook fundraisers, which are super simple, easy ways to uh, raise money on behalf of ACPMP um, in honor of your birthday or another special occasion. So our key educational events, um, we remain committed to patient and physician centered education through our sponsorship of symposiums and scholarships, which can be seen here. We've sponsored numerous scholarships including 29 scholarships to physicians from 12 different countries to attend SOGI last month in Paris. We seek out objectively worthwhile research using a rigorous RPF submission and review process. ACPMP partners with National Organization for Rare Disorders, NORD, to issue RPFs and review respo grant responses. We use two-year $50,000 grants to diversify options and spur progress. We maintain a log of important research published from 2004 to the present that can be accessed through our website. We have awarded $1,100,000 in the form of 23 research grants in the last 10 years, excluding research grants for 2018. There has been a broad range of outstanding doctors in the US and internationally that have been awarded these grants. For us, collaboration is key. We believe that collaboration amongst a broad range of groups is critical to our success and we continue to look for opportunities to expand our relationships, whether it be with patient support groups, researchers, clinical centers, or physicians. Follow us, friend us, like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. These are some pictures of some of the events that we've hosted. And I just want to say a big thank you to Dr. Laura Lambert, the Huntsman Cancer Institute, Joanna Purcell, the Planning Committee, for an outstanding job creating today's symposium. Thank you to all the presenters that are going to share and your, for your leadership and your support. To the doctors and nurses present in the audience, we firmly believe that you will be positively able to affect the outcome of patients in the future. And to the patients, we want you to know that you're not alone. We are here to support you and invite you and your family to join us. Please know that progress towards a cure is happening every single day. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lauren, and thank you to the ACPMP Research Foundation for all the work that you've done. You can see the remarkable history uh, and what they've accomplished in, in truly a short period of time. Um, I am going to proceed now. So 
we get an idea. Okay, got it, everybody? <laughs> you like that? <laughs> so uh, some of you may have uh, heard this presentation before. Um, or, and it, well, let me begin by introducing myself. So, so if those of you who don't know me, my name is Laura Lambert. I'm a surgical oncologist. And uh, as Dr. Sweetenham mentioned, was recruited out to the Huntsman Cancer Institute back in January. Uh, to establish a program um, in, in what we call peritoneal surface malignancies, of which appendiceal cancer and pseudomyxoma is one, and to bring an opportunity for surgical treatment of appendiceal cancer and pseudomyxoma to the Intermountain West, where I know, uh, you know a number of people um, have had to who have been diagnosed with this uh, disease have had to travel long distances to get your, their care. So, for me, it's, um, you know, being here has been a real privilege. Uh, it's wonderful to be in this facility, which really does take excellent care of people and is very patient-centered uh, and focused, and, um, um, and also to be able to bring something to an area so that people don't have to travel. And I know a lot of people that I have met have expressed, you know, their, their gratitude for not have to travel, and I know that's just a huge... Uh, help to it, when you're dealing with something like this to not have to you know travel halfway across the country to get the care that you need So I'm very grateful to be here I feel very privileged to be here and I'm very happy to be here tonight and to speak to you um, And so I, I the title of my talk is uh, pseudomyxoma uh, Peritonei or PMP appendiceal cancer little organ big problem, right? I mean we all know that the the appendix is like this useless flimsy little thing uh, yet it can get us into uh, so much trouble um, and so I actually really often refer to it as the perfect storm. You know, just like I said, here's the, the appendix. It's this uh, small organ uh, that doesn't do anything but get people into trouble and keep surgeons up at night. Uh, it, the uh, cancers and tumors of the appendix are extremely rare. Uh, and they really become, they, because of the anatomy of the appendix is why they become such a, such a big problem. Uh, you know, if you think about it, the appendix is normally about the size of your little finger. It has a very, very thin wall. And if you have a tumor that grows in there, it's very easy for the cells to break through the wall of the appendix to get out and start growing in and around the abdominal cavity. And so, uh, and then there's, you know, there's a lot of space in the abdominal cavity. So these cancers and tumors can grow for quite some time before they let the person know that they're there, that there's anything wrong. Um, and so this combination of it being a rare cancer, uh, growing in the appendix again, which is just useless, uh, this unique tumor biology of how it doesn't necessarily spread through the bloodstream or the, the lymph nodes to cause problems, but just gets out of the appendix and starts growing and causes problems. And then on top of that, once you realize what's going on, you often hear of this very daunting therapy that's the best treatment uh, for, uh, for, this pro for, for this particular problem. And so that's why I refer to it as sort of the perfect storm. And then the other thing is, you know, because it's so rare, oftentimes people will end up with a physician or a provider who's never seen this before, right? And that's what they'll say, well, I've never seen this before. And they're not really sure what to do and they don't know where to send people. And so people have to go online and then it gets really scary because you're not really sure what you're looking at. And, how do I get to somebody who, who can tell me what's going on and what the next step should be? And so, as I mentioned, just a, a basic review um, for those of you who aren't as familiar. Uh, here's what the, this is like a, just a, a drawing of what the appendix looks like. It lives down here in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. It's connected to the first part of the large intestine that we call the cecum. And as I mentioned, it looks like this is what a normal appendix looks like. It's just this long, thin, worm-looking, like looking structure uh, that um, just either causes appendicitis or cause, grows tumors and gets people into trouble. It really, we don't really know what its function is other than that. Um, and so that's what a normal appendix looks like. And um, the, when we refer to, you know, that the um, uh, cancer cells break out from uh, the appendix and start spreading around the peritoneal cavity. You'll hear that term. What that refers to is the peritoneum is the lining of the abdominal cavity. It's a sheet of tissue which actually is, uh, is, has integrity. You can actually remove it and it looks like a sheet of saran wrap and it coats 
all the inside of the abdominal cavity and all of the organs that are in the abdominal cavity, and that's called the peritoneum. And so these, um, as I mentioned, these mucinous tumors of the cancer in the appendix are considered extremely rare. Uh, there's an estimated 1,000 to 1,500 new cases uh, per year. They arise from a certain type of cell that we call the goblet cell, which are part of the inside lining of the appendix. And these goblet cells, what they do is they make mucin. That's what they do. That's their whole function. And uh, mucin is a gelatinous, jelly-like substance. I often describe it to people. It looks kind of like apple jelly. And there's some pictures of it coming up just as a heads up a warning in case you don't like those kinds of things, just so you know. And it's really part of our digestive system. These cells make mucin. Uh, the mucin gets literally sort of secreted or pushed into the inside of the appendix. From there, it goes into the colon, that cecum area, and it mixes with the stool that's there, and it's basically part of just getting things through the digestive system. So it's a very normal thing. Um, but what happens is, uh, you know, but what happens when a mucin producing tumor, so when a tumor or growth occurs, these cells that are producing mucin become abnormal and they start growing and they make a little uh, tumor or cancer. And again, it's in a thin walled structure like the, the, like the appendix. So here's the warning, pictures from surgery coming on the next slide, just so you know. So actually, this is, uh, this is what it can look like on a, on a CAT scan. This is what we call a mucosal <coughs> of the appendix. So if you imagine, there's a tumor inside the appendix and it's making mucin, and that mucin can't now escape into the colon. The appendix gets big like a balloon, and that's what you're seeing right here in this oval. This is an enlarged appendix with mucin in it, and eventually at some point that wall is gonna get so thin that the mucin will escape, or they'll become a hole here. So this, this whole thing right here is actually an appendix. And again, remember, saw that other picture where it looked really thin and, um, narrow, this whole thing right here is an appendix with a big hole in it, literally a big hole out of which the mucin comes, okay? And then this is actually some mucin, this whitish stuff here on the sidewall of the abdomen here. And this is the appendix after it's been removed. This is the tip of it down here. This is the base where it was connected to the cecum. And then this is this hole that was formed by the tumor that was there. And this is what that mucin looks like. This and the term pseudomyxoma peritonei refers to the mucin, the gelatinous mucinous material that these tumors make. And it looks, again, like I said, it kind of looks like apple jelly. This is what it, it can build up um, significantly. There can be liters of this that can build up in a person's abdomen and, uh, and they you know, still function. Um, these basins, just for reference, are five liters each. And so that's from one person. And then unfortunately what can happen over time is if that's not removed and treated is that it can become really hard. And it, uh, this is what, what it looks like when it gets hardened like that. So a little bit of tumor biology, uh, just to kind of um, explain how cancers work. So we, you know, our, our normal cells um, actually have a life cycle, okay? And so they are born, uh, they mature, they have a function, every single cell has a function, and then they die. And that's important because if our cells just kept dividing, our normal cells just kept dividing, we'd, we'd be huge, right? I mean, we, we, would be, we wouldn't be able to function. And so, and this system of being born and maturing and being regulated and, um, and then dying and functioning and dying is a very complex, highly regulated system that usually <laughs> works well most of the time. Um, but tumors or neoplasms um, occur when these cells become what we call immortal. And for some reason, there's loss of that regulation of that cell cycle of the genes that regulate it. And for, and for whatever reason, the cell starts keep dividing and then they make a tumor or a growth, okay? And I specifically say tumor because not all tumors are cancer, okay? You can have a growth that is not a cancer meaning that, and, and some people may be familiar with something called a lipoma, which is like a little fatty tumor that you might feel under your skin, or um, fibroids are very common in, in women, obviously, who have a uterus uh, or in the breast. But these are not cancers, and they're not cancers because they have no risk of spreading to other parts of the body. So cancer occurs, a tumor or growth is considered to be a cancer 
when those cells that are now abnormal because they keep dividing and they've lost the ability to die also gain the ability to spread to other parts of the body and make new tumors, okay? And some of the ways that they can do that are through the bloodstream or through what we call the lymph system, which is part of our immune system, okay? And so that's just to give you some, because there's a lot of terminology around appendiceal tumors and cancers that is confusing. It's confusing not only to patients who are just hearing about it for the first time, it's confusing to the surgical oncologist, the medical oncologist, and even the pathologist. There's huge consensus meetings that we have about what's the best way to categorize these and describe them. So, so I apologize on behalf of the medical community for it being so confusing, but we're still trying to figure it out ourselves. But it's, again, so even though these cancers are rare, they actually come in a spectrum as well. So not only are they rare, but then there are different categories within this, this rare uh, uh, group of tumors. So, and this, this slide kind of shows the spectrum from a normal cell, a normal goblet cell lining the appendix, to then a cell becoming, again, losing that ability to die and making a little tumor or growth, or sometimes referred to as an adenoma. But again, these are not cancers technically. They don't have the ability to spread through the bloodstream or the lymph system to another part of the body and make new cancers. And then the next step up from there is when these cells do get a little bit more abnormal, they've now gained the ability to spread to other parts of the body, they become a true cancer. And we call these adenocarcinomas. And even within this broad category of cancer of the appendix and adenocarcinomas of the appendix, there's a different grade. So there's a low grade or a well differentiated where when the pathologist like Dr. Alfater looks under the microscope and she says, yes, this is definitely a cancer, but it still looks pretty, so there are still features of it that look more normal than abnormal, but it's definitely a cancer, it's doing certain things, but it's not a really, it's not, it, the cells aren't so disorganized and uh, confused looking that they're a high grade or a poorly differentiated. So the pathologists look at these and they've got tons of experience at looking at this and that they're able to put them on the spectrum of low grade or well differentiated to high grade, poorly differentiated or signet ring cells which also have a specific appearance under the microscope and give us a sense of how this tumor might behave. And it's important information for us because it determines what we recommend to people in terms of next steps in treatment, whether it would be surgery or seeing a medical oncologist like Dr. Wisenant and getting chemotherapy up front. And so, and I know there's uh, people in the audience who are on the spectrum, on every part of the spectrum, and you've, and you've uh, known that we have relied heavily on this information to make recommendations. So uh, tumors of the appendix, you can hear different names about them. Sometimes they're referred to as mucinous cyst adenomas or a low-grade mucinous neoplasm, like what Lauren said that she had. There's also this new category called a high-grade mucinous neoplasm that is very rare, and again, it's dependent on the pathologist describing certain features, and it's such an, again, getting back to that, the confusing uh, nomenclature about this that we're not really sure what to do with this category yet, whether, um, so we're still sorting that out. Um, and then again, the cancers, I mentioned mucinous adenocarcinoma and the different uh, grades of those cancers. And then there's another one, another category, all sort of all by itself, called an adenocarcinoid or a goblet cell carcinoid of the appendix. And it's a combined tumor of the goblet cell, it has goblet cell features like we talked about and also something that we call neuroendocrine features and it looks like two different cancers under the microscope happening at the same time. But they do tend to be treated more like the um, uh, cancers, the adenocarcinomas of the appendix. So who gets this? Well, it's actually 50-50, uh, uh, pretty close between men and women. There might be a slight uh, uh, more inclination towards women. The average age is uh, 50, uh, but the ranges, the ages range, uh, as you've seen, you know, Lauren was diagnosed when she was 21, up to, I've seen people diagnosed in their 80s, and, um, and it happens to people from all walks of life. I've had so, you know, I've had so many people ask me, like, you know, how did I get this, you know, uh, and I wish I knew the answer to that question. We have not been able to put a finger on what causes cancer of the appendix, and I've had people say to me, you know, look, I worked with depleted uranium. I was a hairdresser my whole life. I got struck by lightning. I mean, I just, it's so rare 
Um, you know, and people can look back and say, was it this, was it that? We just don't know, all right? And the other question that I get asked all the time is, does it run in families? Are my children at risk for this? And, you know, I, in a way, I kind of wish I could say, yes, it does run in families, because then we could predict who was going to get it, and we could take out their appendix long before they get it. And wouldn't that be wonderful, right? It's a simple appendectomy, a, you know, a day surgery, go home the same day, have your appendix taken out, and not have to worry about it. But we just, we have not ever found a link in families either. Um, there are some theories that it may be related to a bacteria that's very common in our uh, GI tract that is called H. pylori bacterium. And uh, so there are some people who are looking at to see if antibiotics might help either to treat or prevent these tumors. But again, we're, we just don't know what, uh, what causes it. And how does it present? Well, it presents in a lot of different ways. It can show up as just a finding on a CT scan, like that CT scan that I showed you of that appendix. Somebody's getting a CT scan for something else, and there's this funny-looking appendix, and that's how it gets picked up. But more often, it actually presents with symptoms, right? So people come in with their abdomen just doesn't feel good. Um, they get appendicitis. Uh, the abdomen's getting bigger, and somebody told them, well, you're getting older, you're not exercising enough, you know, you got to lose weight. Um, uh, not infrequently in men, they will go in to get a hernia fixed. The surgeon will go in to fix that hernia, and they'll run into all this mucin. Uh, some people can feel a mass. Sometimes it might be just as subtle as sort of some decreased appetite and fatigue, and then a workup at um, somebody I know presented with just a cough, actually, and got a chest CT, and that's how they figured out that something was going on. And so, uh, so it can present in a, in a number of different ways. Again, as I mentioned, there's so much space in that abdominal cavity that, uh, you know, it's very easy. It takes a while for this mucin or tumor to build up to let you know it's there. And so, you know, it's very common. People, you know, a lot of times people look back and say, did I miss something? What did I miss? And, and they didn't miss anything. It just takes that long before it lets you know it's there. And so we tend to see people presenting at a more advanced stage than, um, than, uh, than an earlier stage. And so what do we do once we have a suspicion that something's going on? Well, uh, we rely very heavily on imaging studies like CT scans and MRIs uh, to obviously look at what's going on in the abdomen, but also to see if there's anything going on in the, in the chest or the lungs. If, if somebody has one of the uh, higher grade of tumors where there is an increased risk of it spreading to other parts of the body, we will check you know, the CT scans of the lungs. Obviously, we need to know what it is. So if we see something on a CAT scan, um, we often need to get a biopsy or do a surgery to get some tissue so that we can send it to the pathologist and get an answer as to what it is. So pathology, as I mentioned, is extremely important in helping us manage and make recommendations. And then there are some blood tests that we can check that are called tumor markers. And tumor markers are proteins that are shed by the cancer cells or tumor cells that can show up in the bloodstream. And there's three of them that we typically follow for cancers and tumors of the appendix, and they're the CEA, the CA199, and the CA125. And so we usually try to check those when somebody is first diagnosed to see if they're abnormal or elevated, which shows us that the tumor or cancer cells are making these proteins, and then that gives us a way of following people after they undergo treatment. If those tumor markers go down when somebody has surgery or they start chemotherapy, then we uh, infer that the cancer is responding and that there's fewer cells that are making those proteins. So that's how we follow them. And then we can also use them, uh, you know, if somebody uh, is, has surgery or has their chemotherapy and has a great response and the tumor markers go back to normal. As we follow them, if those tumor markers start to go back up, but the CAT scans are looking good, it just makes us have a little bit more awareness of what might be going on and may change our surveillance plan a little bit. So that's how we use the blood tests. As you know, the treatment is, can be very complicated. Again, we've got this rare tumor, big spectrum of different types of, of tumors, and there's all types of treatments that we can use for this. So we try to use what we call a multidisciplinary approach, meaning that we have uh, surgeons and we have medical oncologists, we have the pathologists involved, we have the radiologists involved we, in helping us to, to determine what's going on on CT scans. 
And we, we routinely come together once a week for what we call a tumor planning conference where uh, we will present a person's case to the board so that everybody can review everything. We can all see the CT scans together. The pathologists show us the slides of the actual pathology uh, from under the microscope and we can talk about what's the next best step for this person in their situation. Uh, obviously some of the treatment options for these tumors and cancers is surgery. Uh, as well as intravenous chemotherapy, the chemotherapy that you get through the vein, intraperitoneal chemotherapy, that's chemotherapy put directly into the abdominal cavity. And which, what recommendation is made really depends, again, back on that pathology. Is it just a, a, a neoplasm, the tumor, with no risk to spread to the rest of the body, but it's gonna be an issue in the abdominal cavity? You know, if that's the case, then our focus is on treating the abdominal cavity, those low-grade mucinous neoplasms don't tend to respond to chemotherapy well because they don't grow very fast and they're, they're in this mucin, so they're protected. So for that person or in that situation, surgery would be the treatment up front probably with the intraperitoneal chemotherapy. But then for somebody who has an adenocarcinoma, one of the higher grades or a signet ring cell, uh, you know, we typically recommend systemic chemotherapy up front, and Dr. Wisenant's going to talk more about that, because those cancers respond to that type of chemotherapy, and we want to treat it, we want to treat the cancer with everything that we can uh, to optimize the outcome, obviously. And so, oftentimes, treating people with intravenous chemotherapy up front, shrinking those cancers, killing as much as we can with the chemotherapy, then makes the possibility of doing a surgery and removing it all much better. Uh, so that's why it's a multidisciplinary approach. And, and obviously also the treatment depends on the extent and the location of the tumors at the time that, that they're diagnosed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC and then or and, uh, something that we call HIPEC, which is hyperthermic intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy. And then uh, Dr. Wisnant's going to talk again about um, treatment from the medical oncology perspective. And then we have a special guest. Uh, who's going to speak to us as well, uh, Mr. Ryan Carter and, and his mom. Uh, and Ryan um, has very familiar with the HIPEC surgery. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the surgery and the HIPEC, and then Ryan's going to share his experience with you. So cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC is used, as I said, for the treatment of any cancer or tumor that has spread through the abdominal cavity. Uh, it's a combined approach, again, in which we use surgery and heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, and that's where the acronym HIPEC comes from. And the goal really is to try to remove all the tumor from the abdomen, and that's what we call cytoreductive, and then put the heated chemotherapy into the abdominal cavity to kill any remaining tumor cells that are left behind. So we can, you know, we can see, obviously we can remove what we can see, but there are cells that are gonna be floating around that are too small for us to see that we're not gonna be able, so they're microscopic. And so that's why we put the heated chemotherapy in there to try to kill any microscopic cells that are left behind. So as I mentioned, the goal is really to remove all the cancer cells or tumor cells that we can see. If we can't get it all out, we try to get it down to a very bare minimum of not more than a quarter of a centimeter of tumor cells left behind, so just a little bit. Usually to do this, as many of you in here know, uh, it requires an incision that goes from the breastbone down to the pubic symphysis, so the, or the pubic bone. And, uh, and this is what the list can look like of things that we may or may not have to do to get all the tumor out. So we may have to remove parts of the colon or the intestine. We usually remove something called the omentum, which is an apron of fat that hangs down in front of the abdomen that everybody has. It acts like a sponge. It collects anything in the abdomen that shouldn't be there, like mucin or tumor cells. So we remove that, and people can live without their own mental. We don't remove anything that people can't live without. Everything that we, is up here, people can live without. Um, we often have to take out uh, the gallbladder in ladies, uh, the uterus and ovaries. The ovaries, unfortunately, are a very frequent place where this tumor can recur. They, the, the ovaries are, seem to attract tumor cells for some reason. We often have to take out the spleen if it's got tumor on it, strip the lining of the abdominal cavity, that peritoneum, and we may have to remove other parts of the bowel, part of the pancreas. And you always talk about people about possibly needing what we call an ileostomy or a colostomy after the surgery. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, that's where um, a part of the intestine is brought up to the wall of the stomach or the abdomen, 
uh, and the bowels, instead of going through the usual route, will move into an appliance that's put over, uh, the, over that area. So why intraperitoneal chemotherapy? Why give it into the abdomen? Well, when, when I share this with people, they're like, well, that makes sense, right? See, because we can give a much larger dose of chemotherapy directly where the tumor cells are at the time when there's the least amount of cancer there, right? So in theory, it really makes sense to do this, right? We're putting the can the, a higher dose of chemotherapy directly on this, where the area where the cancer cells were um, or are. And then the next question is obviously, well, why hyperthermia, right? Why heat? We have actually known for a very, very, very long time that heat kills cancer cells. Cancer cells are more sensitive to heat than normal cells. And so that's one reason to use it. And the other reason is that the chemotherapies that we use work better at a higher temperature. So that's another reason. And then the third reason is uh, we've, there have been studies to show that the heat helps the chemotherapy penetrate a little bit deeper into the tissue. So those are the reasons why we use hyperthermia. And again, I encourage you to look at the device that w that's out there that's circulating, that heats and circulates the chemotherapy through the abdomen when we're doing the surgery. So, um, so the way the surgery works is that the, all the surgery is done first, all the tumor is removed, and then we use this device that you can see out, uh, outside uh, to circulate and heat the chemotherapy through the abdominal cavity to wash it, bathe it in uh, the chemotherapy and kill any cancer cells. And we usually do that for 90 minutes, okay? At the end of the 90 minutes, we um, drain the chemotherapy back out, uh, take the device out and, and then close the abdomen. The post-operative course um, can be long. There's no question about that. Most patients go to the intensive care unit initially. Um, they will eventually transfer to the oncology floor, uh, usually within 48 to 72 hours. You know, the, the thing that I always emphasize, and really one of the reasons why I was so delighted to be recruited out to the Huntsman Cancer Institute is that the, the nurses here all get the fact that everybody that's here is dealing with cancer, right? And they get the fact that the, the patient's family are dealing with cancer. And so everybody gets that. And they have just been wonderful. They have embraced this program, uh, really took it upon themselves to educate themselves and to learn about HIPEC and what the recovery looks like. And they've just done a terrific job in getting and helping people recover while they're in the hospital. And I'm very grateful for that because the average hospital stay is somewhere between seven to 10 days. And the reason for that is because whenever we operate on somebody's intestines, they just stop working for a while. Okay, normally your intestines are moving uh, in a very coordinated fashion to push things from the top to the bottom, right? And uh, when you operate on them, when you open up the abdomen, you touch them, they just stop doing that for a while. And that's called an ileus. When you add heated chemotherapy on top of that, they shut down for quite a while. Um, and so it's really the reason why people stay in the hospital for that long is we're just waiting for their intestines to wake up so they can drink enough so they don't get dehydrated when they leave the hospital, eating enough so that they are, are eating some, I shouldn't say eating enough, eating some, um, and so that the, when, they, when they go home that, again, they won't get dehydrated. And that's, like I say, the length of stay is determined by that ileus. So if you go online, and I know a lot of people do, um, there's a lot of scary stuff out there. You might come across this acronym, which is the MOAS, or the mother of all surgery, right? So, and there, there's a good, you know, there's, there's good reason for that. And I'm not trying to scare people, but I, I do want to be honest about this. You know, the average surgery time is, is probably around seven to eight hours, but they can, they can be long surgeries, and it depends on how much tumor there is, how much previous surgery a person has had. Uh, in surgery, when we're kind of doing quality control of how are we doing, we look at a couple of things. One is something that we call morbidity and the rate of complications. Now, if you look through the literature, you will see a wide range of complications associated with any surgery has a risk of complications. When you add heat to chemotherapy on that, it can go up. Um, if you look through the literature, there's a wide range of rates of complications. Um, and anywhere from 15 to 75 percent. Now, you might say, well, why is it so broad? I mean, is this people? Is the hospital that's getting 75 percent complicated? Do they just not know what they're doing. Well, it really depends on how how rigorous are you looking at your complication. Are you counting every urinary tract infection or you know every little hiccup, and you can get up to 75 percent pretty easily? Or are you looking at the major complications, the one that are requiring people to have to go back to surgery or stay in the hospital longer or require intravenous nutrition or something like that? And so 
That's why that range is so broad. Um, the mortality rate, so that is, you know, how many people actually die because of the surgery, within 30 days of the surgery. I put that asterisk there because the 15% is still in the literature, but it's from the much earlier experience that we have now, high volume centers, like here at the Huntsman, the mortality rate is well, 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 well below 5%. It should be in the one to 2% range at the most, and obviously everybody is striving for zero. We're striving for zero. Again, I mentioned the length of stay is anywhere between a week to two weeks. Sometimes it can be longer if there is a complication. There's no question about that. And the recovery is really measured in, in months. You know, I tell people when they ask me, well, how long does it take to recover from that? First I say, well, define recover, right? <laughs> um, and then the other, the way I try to, try to frame it for people is if you're thinking about getting back to work, it's usually about three months. That's kind of an average. Some people will get back to work sooner. Some people will take longer. It'll depend on how fit the person is coming into surgery. It'll depend on how much tumor they had, how much surgery we have to do to get a complete tumor removal. Was there a complication? So that's kind of a, a big picture way of thinking about it. It's usually about three months before people are thinking about getting back to work. It really can be about six months before people are feeling like they've really got the wind back in their sails and they've completely recovered from this surgery. So it, it is, it, there's no question. Uh, if anybody's been through this, you've really been through one of the biggest surgeries that we put people through. But this is why we do it, okay? And so here, so there are some, uh, some patients that I've had the privilege to be a part of their journey and, and operate on them. And um, these are actually from the University of uh, Massachusetts, but two of the people on the picture are actually from Utah, <laughs> uh, including this man down here. And this little girl's name is Laura, so <laughs> uh, she's cute, yes. And, um, and actually this, this man here as well is from Utah, and so that's us skiing together up at Snow Basin. And, uh, and this is why we do it. Um, uh, you know, it's to really to, uh, to help take care of people and, and help them uh, through this incredible uh, challenging journey that they're on. Uh, I don't do it alone, uh, obviously. Um, uh, this is a, a definitely a, a team effort, as Dr. Sweetenham said. We've got, you know, the, the Department of Surgical Oncology, the GI medical oncologists who work very closely with us, our pathologists, our, our tumor board. Uh, as I mentioned before, the nurses uh, from the clinic, uh, some of whom are here as well, um, the nurses uh, and affiliated providers on the in the ICU on the floor, our perfusionists who are out here. Um, the pharmacy who's been helpful. And we're also, again, I'm still relatively new here, but there, we're in the process of putting together some research programs here. Here are some of the studies that we're looking at um, and also having our annual uh, penicillin cancer symposium. So as I just want to emphasize again, like Lauren said, like I said before, you are not alone. Um, there are, uh, most of the people in here have been affected by a penicillin cancer. Uh, either themselves or with, with someone that they know. Uh, here are a couple of, uh, when people come and they wanna, they have either been online or whatever, I, these are the two uh, safe websites that I give people, the ACPMP Research Foundation and another organization called PMP Pals, uh, which is a more of a support group, but it will connect you with people who have been through the surgery, been through the treatment, or dealing with appendiceal cancer, or living with appendiceal cancer, and then I am always available. So there's my email. And uh, so I'm gonna stop there. And um, I'm gonna just turn the time over to Dr. Wisnett so he can talk about the medical oncology perspective. But afterwards, and then we're gonna hear from Ryan. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, we're gonna be here to answer any questions that you have, Dr. Wisnett, Dr. Al Alfater, myself, and um, there'll be the people that I mentioned um, out front, if, so if you want to talk to the perfusionist or talk to Lauren more about ACPMP or uh, find out more about Huntsman at home, please stay and eat the food and, um, and ask questions. And, and please, I hope you have a chance to, to talk to each other and meet each other as well. So thank you very much. So it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Jonathan Wisnett, who is one of the GI medical oncologists here at the Huntsman Cancer Institute and, and probably known to many of you in the room as well. And uh, just grateful that he was willing to come and talk to us tonight about systemic therapies in appendiceal cancer. Okay. It's hard to follow Lara. Uh, I think the first time I met her was years ago and she's one of the most 
thoughtful, caring, uh, thorough people I know. So it's a little bit hard to put me after her. I should start before her so I, get, so I, so I don't have to, to kind of match what she's doing. But anyway, um, so Laura asked me to talk about systemic therapies of uh, adenocarcinoma. And it's kind of a hard topic. And I, I, I think it's a little bit confusing, too. So hopefully at the end, if you feel confused, it probably reflects a little bit of the uncertainty on our part because there's a lot that we're still trying to figure out um, because it's a hard disease to study, basically. So I, sometimes when I start talking about chemotherapy and systemic therapies, I realize that I'm using words that don't really make sense. And so I kind of thought we'd start by just doing a really basic idea of what are we really talking about. Um, what, what is systemic therapy? What are the options for systemic therapy? And what are the issues that really we directly face with appendix cancers? So when I think about the therapies we use for cancer, I think about local therapies, kind of regional therapies, and systemic therapies. And local therapies, the kind of gold standard of a local therapy is cutting something out, right? If you see a tumor, you go and cut it out. All that you do is cut out what you, what you see. Um, we have other local therapies. Sometimes with certain cancers, their cancers, they'll use radiation or what we call ablation, where they heat it up or burn it or something like that. Regional therapies is something that I would consider more like high -pec. Right, where they try to treat the entire region. So not just the cancer you can see where you cut it out, but then you also add chemotherapy to that region. Or sometimes we'll often talk about regional therapies where we treat the liver with what we call liver-directed therapies. And then systemic therapy is what we think of, of um, therapies that go into the bloodstream and basically go throughout your body, right? And so there, we're usually administering it either intravenously or with a pill. And the idea is that it's going everywhere. And that's why there are uh, toxicity with it, toxicities with it, because it also goes to your eyes and your, and your hair and everything else, right? So when we think about systemic therapies, we're usually thinking about cytotoxic chemotherapies, targeted therapies, immune therapies, and sometimes we try to combine them to make them work better. So for, for medical oncologists, we have this kind of old way we think about cytotoxic chemotherapy, and that's the old you know, from the movies from the 80s where you see people walk around with an IV pole with their hair falling out, kind of throwing up, you know, it, this, is, this is medicine that's usually given int intravenously that's designed to destroy cancer cells. And generally it's aimed not at a specific abnormality in the cancer, but it's trying to damage either the precursors to DNA, you know, to part of the genes in the cell, or damage the DNA itself, or damage some of the, um, the cellular machinery that allowed the cells to divide. And so this is kind of a different places along the DNA replication path where we kind of target them with different types of chemotherapies. The biggest problem with chemotherapy is that it's not really smart. You know, it kind of just kills cells that are dividing. It's not quite that dumb, but it, but it doesn't rely on it to be cancer. That's why your hair can fall out, your nails can get brittle, people can get sick to their stomach, they can get diarrhea, they can get problems like that. With, there's this new, over the last 15, 20 years, there's been a lot of excitement about what we call targeted therapies. And so with targeted therapies, we're trying to identify very specific proteins that are kind of abnormally turned on and fueling cancer growth, right? And so the hope is that if we, if we can find a mutation, a mutated gene that's making an abnormal protein fuel cancer growth, and then we're if we're lucky enough to have a drug that can block that, we can really be successful in turning off the fuel supply to the cancer. And so this is kind of one of the classic pathways that we look at with cancer growth, this RAS, MET, RAF, MEC, ERK pathway. And you can see like there will be a factor, it'll turn on the proteins, and those will activate other proteins. They end up, and end up leading to cell division. And that's kind of a, that looks complicated, but the reality is, it ends up being much more complicated than we thought it was. And so the more we learn about this, the more we, we, we realize that we start to target different proteins and we, turn, we kind of cause all these other problems and, and the proteins talk to other proteins and turn on other, other pathways. And so some of the drugs that we think work in certain ways, we find out that they work in ways that we didn't even expect to work or they cause other problems and turn on other pathways. So they're not quite as clean as we thought they, as we kind of wish they were and thought they were initially. And then the other kind of big hot thing with our systemic therapy are these immune therapies. And so this has been really hot in the last five or 10 years. And a lot of you have probably heard about immune therapies. Um, these are basically mostly drugs, but some way to try to 
enhance the immune response to cancer. So we either try to unmask, so that the cancers have ways of shutting down the immune. So go back to the beginning, if you get a, an abnormal cell that's trying to, that starts to grow, our body is supposed to recognize that and kill it, right? Before it has a chance to become a tumor developed into a cancer. But the cancer is smart and the tumors are smart, so they have designed ways to basically hide from, the, from, the, from your own immune system. And so a lot of the work right now is trying to, dev to, to design ways that we can allow the, the body to recognize those tumor cells again. And if you can do that, you can really have a long-term benefit because the body keeps it in check. So one of the big ones is, is this immune checkpoint blockade, and that's one of the ones that people have heard about. Basically, um, there's a group of drugs that, that has figured out one of the primary mechanisms in which the tumors hide from the... From the um, can't from the immune system and we block that ability for the tumors to hide and then the immune system can recognize that and, and start and uh, attack the cancer. So those are kind of our primary systemic therapies. So the other thing I kind of want to just put into perspective is when we're trying to figure out whether these work, we do these big trials and we have ways that we try to define how is this working and we use these terms like response rate and progression-free survival and overall survival. What we're trying to figure out is, is this treatment really working? So one thing, like a perfect trial, we'll take a, a thousand people and they'll give chemotherapy to half and they'll give some other, and they'll maybe go a placebo or some other therapy and they'll look to see how often they see shrinkage. And shrinkage doesn't necessarily always matter, but if you see shrinkage, it means that the drug's working. Right? So we, we use this response rate for a marker of, hey, this drug works. And we have these really strict criteria. You know, a, a, a tumor has to shrink by, by 30% to meet the criteria of, yes, this is working. Or sometimes we look at, okay, if I start treatment today, how long is it before we see growth? Right? When, and is it going to be six months or is it going to be a year? Is it going to be two years before you see growth? And if, it, and if we expect it to be six months, but then we give a drug and it takes a year and a half and we say, hey, we've done something, right? And then the gold standard, kind of what we think is what the big difference is, is where are we 10 years from now, right? Are we gonna have more people alive and free of cancer 10 years from now or, or not, right? I mean, because if we get things to shrink, but ultimately we don't make a difference, then you have to really say, what are we really doing? So I, I, I think that it's important to kind of understand where we're coming from partly because of the difficulty of studying appendix cancer. And then the last is how we look at, so when we look at trials, we look at a curve like this. I don't know if, if all of you are good at understanding graphs, but this is, a, this is kind of one of the recent colon cancer clinical trials. And they basically start at the month zero with 100% of people alive. And they look to see how people do if we give them chemotherapy. And this, this trial basically showed that, that the two arms were pretty similar. But, you know, when you read the report of the trial, it basically says, you know, here is where half the people, how long they live. That's about 33 months, right? And so, you know, people sometimes say, well, what's going to, how, how long, how long am I going to live or something? And the problem is that, you know, 20% of people don't even live a year, right? But then we also look out here and you see that you've got about 15% of people that five, six, seven years later are still alive, right? And we really like to see what we call a tail of the curve. We like to see that plateau kind of level out because we hope that those are people who are going to do really well for a long time. But you can see there's a lot of variability in how, how things go, which makes it really hard to tell to kind of predict how things are going to play out. So as far as appendix cancer goes, um, the primary issues we struggle with knowing what to do with systemic therapies are based on a little bit what Lara was talking about. First, this, there are a lot of different malignancies and she talked about the spectrum that there are these tumors that aren't, aren't really true cancers and then there are these lower grade slow growing cancers and then there are some higher grade fast growing cancers. So we look at sometimes an adenocarcinoma of the appendix and most of them are mucinous, but some aren't. You know, some really look more like a colon cancer and they're non-mucinous. 
And then we look at signet ring cell adenocarcinoma, and we see that it actually is kind of scary for us because they, they, they progress really rapidly, and, and, and those scare us. And then we look at the pseudomyxoma peritonei. When I was in training, we used to say that pseudomyxoma peritonei were really from the non-cancerous tumors, the ones that didn't spread through the bloodstream. But now we've expanded the definition to include some of the true cancer, some of these what we call adenocarcinomas, right? And so we try to decide, well, is it really a cancer? And, and Kaisa can tell you their pathologists, you know, we'll talk at this at our treatment planning conference and we'll say, well, is it cancer? And she'll kind of say, well, um, and so it's not always really clear. Um, but, but, and then there's these goblet cell carcinoids, which, which as Lara mentioned, really behave more like a true colon cancer or an adenocarcinoma. And then there are also true carcinoids, which we see frequently of, of the, of, in, the, in the appendix. They're all pretty rare. And there's all this, oh, also this question of how well does the therapy we give get to the abdominal cavity? You know, do we deliver it really well? But, the, but these issues, you know, especially variable clinical course being rare, make it really hard to study. Because if you have 10 people with an adenocarcinoma of the, of its mucinous, and then, and then you throw in a few signet ring cells and you split, split them into two groups, it's gonna totally change your, your, make it hard to interpret how much good you're doing. So we end up extrapolating from colon cancer treatment a lot, and we try to use this because it's very similar. We try to use those, those look at the, the therapies using colon cancer and see how do they work in appendix cancer and try to infer from that. So today, the, really, the can't, we don't, I'm not going to talk about neuroendocrine tumors. Um, goblet cell carcinoids are a lot like an adenocarcinoma in the appendix. And then there's this whole issue of pseudomyxoma peritonei, which we really focus on the true cancers, the adenocarcinoma, rather, rather than the benign, call them benign, they're not really benign, but the non-cancerous growths. So if you go back to colon cancer, I kind of like this slide. This is a slide that's uh, 14 years old. Basically, 20 years ago, there was all this worked in with colon cancer, and we saw the, that people lived, every time we had these new cancers, the, the median survival, so the average survival went up by a little bit, by a few months. And so 20 years ago, if you looked at a paper with colon cancer, it would say, hey, if somebody has a colon cancer that spread to the appendix, the average time they live is like 10 or 12 months. And we had one drug, it was called 5-fluorouracil, or 5-FU, which everybody remembers the 5-FU. Um, and then we added these other drugs, irinotecan, oxaliplatin, some of these targeted agents, some of the newer oral agents, and, and most recently some of these immunotherapies. And what this slide shows is that as people were exposed to more drugs, their survival just kept climbing. And so this is from 14 years ago, and the survival had gone from 10 months to 15 months to 18 months to 22 months. And the most recent study that I put on, on, on the initial um, earlier showed that in colon cancer, the average you know, how people live is over is more than tripled. So for us, that's good. Unfortunately, when we say 33 months, it doesn't sound so good if you're in, in the chair that we're talking to, even though we feel like we're finally helping people a little bit. So when we look at colon cancer, and this is similar for appendix cancer, this is kind of our, our, our menu of options we have for treatment for colon cancer. We have this old drug, 5-FU, and then there's a pill form of that called capecitabine. Then in the next column, we have these other two drugs that have been around for about 15 years, oxaliplatin and irinotecan. And then we have these targeted therapies. Some of them target, are supposed to be targeting blood vessel supply. They may actually be more enhancing the ability to deliver the chemotherapy to the tumors. We also have this, these other targeted therapies called anti-EGFR antibodies. And one of them, cetuximab, is the one that got um, Martha Stewart in trouble back 20 years ago. She sold her stock a year too early because a year later it was approved and it became a really important drug in this disease. Um, and then the last two are these ones in parentheses, the regorafenib and the lone surf. And these are, these are oral therapies. The regorafenib is a lot like the anti-VEGF therapy. The lone surf is very similar to the capecitabine and the 5-FU. And so what we end up doing is we choose one from column one and one from column two and often add one from column three. If you take 5-FU and add soliplatin, we get, a, we get a, something called Folfox. Or we take 5-FU and we add it to irinotecan, we call it full fury. Or we take cape side, we add it to oxaliplant, we call it capox. And when you add that, those together, you're more likely to get benefit. And then we end up with colon cancer, 
this is how we get to the 33 months. You know, so you take Folfox and then you add bevacizumab to it and it controls the cancer on average 10 or 12 months. And remember, when you look at that first slide, you know, the, the, the distribution means that that really means anywhere from 16 to 24, from, from six to 24 months of control. And if that stops working, you might move to full fury and then, and that works for six months, which really means somewhere between four months and a year. Occasionally we'll, we'll, it'll work for a year and a half or two years, but eventually the cancer starts growing and it figures out resist, ways to grow in spite of the chemotherapy. And then if they don't have a very specific mutation that deems, that, that, that deems this uh, not responsive to these anti-EGFR antibodies, we'll use these medicines called cetuximab or panitumab, and that will control the cancer for four to 10 months. And then these other two drugs, Lone Surf and Regorapinib, they're okay. You know, they kind of control for a couple of months, but they haven't been real blockbusters. But you start to add those up and you see where you get to the three year mark, right? So that's colon cancer. So with um, appendix cancer, it's been really hard to perform these big trials. And so we don't have the same level of confidence of how well these work. And so what we end up, and then we also have this issue that Lara was referring to where the cancer is in the abdominal cavity, which makes it really hard to tell how well it's working, right? So if you've got a spot in your lung, you can watch it grow and shrink because it's surrounded by air and you can see it really well. But if it's coating the lining of your abdominal cavity, I think this is one of the most difficult places to assess how well the treatment's working. You, you can't really tell how well it's shrinking. We notoriously underestimate the, 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 how much disease is in there. You know, we'll, you know, we'll look at these scans and we'll say, oh, maybe there's something there, maybe there's something there. Lara, Dr. Lambert's got a much better eye and she'll say, oh, I see, see it there and there. But then, then they'll go to the operating room and they'll say, oh, it's much more extensive than we thought it was gonna be. And studies suggest that we're not really good at telling how well it's working. You know, I mean, we, we think that things are working and then they operate and they said, oh, it, it you know, times it didn't work, it seemed to work. And other times where we thought it worked, it didn't seem to work very well. And so we combine it with these tumor markers like uh, Dr. Lambert was talking about. I actually feel like the C125 is one of the best ones. You know, it's one that we use for ovarian cancer. And so we check it on men and people are like, why are you checking a C125? But it's really probably a marker of inflammation in the peritoneal lining. And it seems to be one of the ones that really is probably a good marker of what's happening with the cancer. We try to combine these and get a sense of how well things are working. And then there's this issue of the acellular mucin, right? So if you've got a whole bunch of this mucin, this jelly in there, and there are cancer cells that are making it and you treat the cancer, you might kill the cancer, but the mucin stays there. And so it makes it really hard to tell how much good have we done. If the mucin keeps growing, then you say, well, obviously there's some cancer making mucin still, but if, it, but if it stays the same, you don't really know if it's just not growing slowly or, or if we've killed cancer and we've, we've stopped the, the process of the mucin. And then the other issue is that it's not, it's not colon cancer. You know, it, it, it's not only does it, does it, um, is it just a different cancer, but it's more slow growing. And so some of the things that we usually rely on to tell if these therapies are working with appendix cancer, we, they don't mean as much with appendix cancer because they grow, it grows more slowly. Um, a lot of these low-grade mucinous cancers will, people will live for five, 10, longer than that, you know, 15 years. And that's pretty uncommon with colon cancer. So, um, you know, this is kind of an example. I, this is the slide that I showed earlier, and this is the survival with colon cancer, right? And then this over here is one of the bigger trials where they looked at both the, the mucinous adenocarcinoma and the, the mucinous peritonei that's not a true cancer, and they looked at the survival. But the point is that this is 10 years out, and the, the, mus, the mucinous non-cancer, you know, you've got 80% of people still doing well 10 year, almost 10 years later. And even in the true cancer, you've got, you know, 30%, which isn't great, but it, it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's a real number. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a, which is not like colon cancer. So if you look at, you know, we basically use the exact same treatments we use for colon cancer and we use them for appendix cancer. And the, the, they work, I mean, they work okay. You know, the, when you look at them, we actually, it feels like we kind of come in with this bias that we don't think they work very well, but in the studies, when they go back and look, it does appear that they do work. You know, we do get shrinkage. We do control disease for some period of time. 
It probably doesn't work quite as well as it does for colon cancer, and that might be partly, I mean, in terms of getting shrinkage, and that might be because of this mucin and things like that. Um, we've used a lot more of this full fox than we have full fury, but lately there's been a lot more enthusiasm about full fury. It's looking like a really pretty active, active um, um, combination of chemotherapy. Um, these anti-EGFR, the cetuximab drugs, you know, it's interesting because there's been a, a less enthusiasm in using these drugs in colon cancers that come from the cecum or the right side of the colon, which is where the appendix is. Um, there's been a lot of question about whether it really helps, but, but it seems like it works in some of these appendix cancers. And so it's different than colon, it, it, but it does work. Um, immune therapy, really in colon cancer, the, um, the benefit has been restricted to this really small group of people that have something called microsatellite instability, um, which is a process that, that leads to a lot of mutations in cancer, but we don't see that nearly as frequently in appendix cancer. You know, whereas in colon cancer, we might see as many as 15% of patients and appendix cancer is probably like two or 3%. I mean, it's much less common. But when immune therapy works, it can work incredibly well. It can control it for many, many years. And so we always look for this microsatellite instability. And, and, and if we see it, we, we really push, we really kind of cross our fingers and hope the immune therapy is going to work. But the data basically says that these well-differentiated non-mucinous cancers of the appendix seem to be very similar to colon cancer. They respond pretty well. The well-differentiated mucinous tumors, they don't shrink as well. People maybe do a little bit better when we give chemotherapy, but, but it's un, it, the benefit doesn't seem to be as dramatic. Um, we have more of this very specific mutation that makes it unlikely to use these anti-EGFR antibodies. It, 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 that's the group that I think is really hard to know what role chemotherapy has. And then there are these signet ring cell cancers that tend, chemotherapy does tend to work, but it doesn't work as long. But that's where the data has shown that when we give chemotherapy with these, with these aggressive signet ring cell cancers, people do better than if they don't get chemotherapy. So we're kind of left with when do you use it? You know, there, there are studies look, looking at what if we add chemotherapy to HIPEC? Because the surgery in HIPEC has really been the backbone for a lot of it, kind of the, really, the, the, it is the gold standard for a, lot of, for a lot of this cancer. So they've said, well, what about if we give chemotherapy before or give chemotherapy after? And this study is basically suggesting that um, systemic chemotherapy in the Low grade cancers, maybe there is maybe some benefit if it's a true cancer, but it's, it's not clear how big the benefit is. And the higher grade ones, there appears to be a bigger benefit from giving chemotherapy. Um, that's kind of what this other, I mean, it's, this is the problem. They're very bad studies. You know, they're just not high enough, not because we don't try, but the, the numbers are too small. But, but basically, it looks like the higher grade cancers do live longer and do better and control the cancer longer if we give chemotherapy to them. So in the so kind of to summarize, I think the problem is that it's really hard to study these hard to make firm recommendations and there's very imprecise estimates of how much we benefit people when we give chemotherapy <coughs> to. The randomized studies we have, which is the kind of the way we're supposed to study this, we're supposed to flip a coin and figure out if a treatment really works. They're, they're virtually non-existent. Um, and so, and, and we don't really have great guidelines to help, so we rely on kind of expert consensus, we rely on clinical experience. Um, it, but it does have some benefit. The, it definitely depends on the underlying disease. The mucinous tumors tend to be, tend to be except for the high-grade mucinous signet ring cell, the low-grade mucinous tumors, we tend to be a little bit less um, enthusiastic about rushing into chemotherapy, whereas the non-mucinous tumors and this, in the, in the more aggressive appearing tumors, we have a much lower threshold to get, get chemotherapy going earlier. Um, there's still a really unclear um, role of these anti-GFR antibodies, but we use them and, and they appear to work. We're still trying to figure out exactly when and how to use them. Um, this MSI issue, this microsatellite instability, we check it on everybody. We don't see it very often, but when we do, we get very enthusiastic about immune therapy. We do treat it like colon cancer. 
full fox we use we is kind of our been our go-to but but there's a lot more enthusiasm for full fury lately um and you know these chemotherapies i mean a lot of you in here have had it they're i i always and maybe i'm correct me if i'm wrong i haven't had chemotherapy but i always tell people that it's kind of mild to moderate in terms of side effects you know people absolutely have side effects they get fatigue they get nausea but it usually usually doesn't put them in bed the whole time. You know, they might have three or four days where they feel pretty crummy and then they start to feel, feel better and then they, and then they do okay. Um, and, but people can still work. They can still go to the store. They can still take care of their family. They can still do normal things. And so for most people, it's worth it to, to do these things. Um, the, these targeted agents are really, are, we're really trying to figure out how, how to use them. You know, I mean, bevacizumab, the problem with, with using Avastin or Bevacizumab is it, it, it's got kind of a modest benefit in colon cancer when we add these to chemotherapy. But the thing we always worry about is um, abdominal um, perforations of, of the intestine. And when people are getting high pec and they're getting surgery and we're already struggling with issues with leaks and perforations, it makes us a little bit um, wary or cautious about what, when, when to add Avastin, when it's safe to add Avastin. Um, and, but, but right now, you know, we basically consider chemotherapy more and more before surgery now because we, we, you know, even though we really trust and rely on our pathologists, sometimes they say something looks aggressive and, and it's not as aggressive as we think it is and they do, people do better. And so we'll sometimes give chemotherapy to get a sense of how are things going to play out over the next six months, right? So if Dr. Lambert is not saying, yeah, let's book you next week then we'll often say, hey, let's, let's see how this goes and, and prove to me that you're not gonna, it's not gonna show up in your liver, it's not gonna grow really fast because the last thing you wanna do is go through high pec or big surgery like that and then just as you're recovering from that, it's spread somewhere else or it's growing back, right? And so we kinda prove that it's still going well. Um, sometimes people come and they've already had one surgery and they're recovering and, and they're not ready to go for a second surgery and rather than give it four months and do nothing, we'll say, hey, let's give you chemotherapy, make sure we keep it under control, planning on, planning on surgery later. Um, sometimes um, we're worried about just how you're gonna tolerate it because, how, because how, pe how sick people are and they're not ready and we wanna just give them a chance to kind of get back on their feet. And frankly, people can feel better and improve and recover during chemotherapy. It sounds, a lot of people don't believe that. It sounds kind of counterintuitive, but, but people can kind of get back on their feet while they're getting chemotherapy. Um, and then also if it's really extensive, so I, uh, Dr. Lambert didn't talk about this, but there's something they call this perineal score, this PCI, and the perineal um, index. And if there's extensive disease, that's a much bigger, more complicated surgery, higher likelihood of complications. And so if we can shrink it and actually debulk it and kind of make the disease less, then we're going to be more enthusiastic about reconsidering surgery, um, and then and then you know I, I there's a lot of debate about whether you give chemotherapy after high pec. Um, most people, if if they've done it, if we've been able to get a good surgery, I'm usually not a big fan of getting chemotherapy after. I say, hey, let's see how this goes, right? Let's we, we've done what we need to do. Let's see how it goes. But sometimes we talk about if we are surprised with surgery or we feel like we didn't get everything out or something, well talk about whether resume chemotherapy after surgery. Um, when people have this hematogenous spread, right? So if the cancer spreads not just into the abdominal cavity, but we see it in the lungs or the liver, those are people who we really say, yeah, this is something that we need to, we need to consider chemotherapy because chemotherapy clearly, that's a true cancer and chemotherapy clearly works in that kind of, in that kind of disease. The high grade, the aggressive looking cancers are the ones that clearly benefit. I mean, I, 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 I have to be careful the way I say clearly benefit. The, the, we, it's it's something we absolutely have to address it. Um, if someone's not a candidate for surgery, you know, the, it, right now, for whatever reason, we talk about whether it makes sense to give chemotherapy now. Um, occasionally, if there's an early recurrence after surgery, we say, you know, rather than rushing back to surgery, let's try to get this under control with systemic therapy. Um, the other kind of ongoing issues are how do we sequence and combine systemic therapies with surgery or high pec or how can you combine, you know, can we 
you tar combine these immune therapies with some of these targeted therapies, are we going to get a better response? You know, that's what most of our clinical trials for colon cancer include, are, are maybe adding immune therapy to chemotherapy or to one of these angiogenesis inhibitors because they can enhance the, um, they can, they can enhance the, uh, uh, the, the immune system and try to kind of ramp up the immune, the immune system. Uh, where, what do we do with targeted therapies? That's a big issue that we're still trying to figure out. You know, we need clinical trials. The problem is that these randomized trials are almost impossible because of the small numbers and the huge variation, and there's a lot of bias. I mean, especially with surgery, you know. I mean, it's really hard for, for us to expect anybody to say, flip a coin and the heads I go to surgery, tails I don't, right? I mean, it's really hard for us to, 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 uh, to do that. And, and so we end up with these single arm trials, you know, we kind of say, we're going to do this and see how people do. And, and we, we, we want to do these, we want to do this just so we can kind of see how do people do so we have good information that we can glean, glean some, you know, kind of make some decisions from. And I think this is going to be one of those cancers where, you know, this whole big data thing is going to, medicine's really behind on big data. Apparently like Google does a great job, right? I've heard of this, you guys know Google, right? <laughs> But you know, they're, they should have gotten medicine 10 years ago, you know, and they're coming around and they're, and they're gonna be using big data and they're gonna be able to take these rare diseases and pull the 2,000 people that have, the, you know, the 1,000 people that are diagnosed and look at the molecular changes, the mutations, and look at who got chemo and who didn't and really try to give us some information. And I really think this is where we're gonna learn more rather than our randomized trials, but we still do more trials. If you look at the, NCI database of clinical trials with appendix cancer right now, they're almost all have high PEC. They're all surgery with something or surgery with chemotherapy. Actually, I looked earlier and MD Anderson has one and they randomize patients where half of the patients get chemotherapy and half of the people don't get chemotherapy. And then after six months, they switch. And they're trying to figure out, does chemotherapy really help? <laughs> It's kind of a, I mean, it's an interesting, it's, it seems crazy that this is where we, we're still trying to decide how much do we really help people, but that's where we are. So I think to me, the chemotherapy, there, there's absolutely a role. It's just trying to tease it out. And you know, like, like Dr. Lambert said, you know, this morning at 7.30, we're all sitting in a room with 15 doctors and, and we say, hey, should we consider high pec? Should we look at, we talk to the pathologist, say, what is this? And we do that every Tuesday. And it ends up being a joint effort and I, you know, people sometimes say, what did, what did you guys decide at the conference? And our response is often, well, it was an active discussion, which means usually the patients we're, treating, we're talking about at these conferences, there's not a right or wrong answer. It's kind of a try to come to consensus and decide what really makes the best sense. And appendix cancer is kind of the, the a prototype for that. You know, there's often not a right or wrong answer. It's kind of what's right today and might be wrong tomorrow and it's different for everybody. So. I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. So now we're going to move on to my favorite part of the evening, and I'm going to invite Ryan and uh, his mom to come up to the podium and share their story with us. I am, uh, I am Ryan Carter. I have had a lot of health problems throughout my life. I have been uh, diagnosed with lupus. I have lupus in my kidneys and in my joints and most um, effectively in my lungs. Um, this February, I was asleep one night and I couldn't sleep very well and they started having some pain in my appendix. We decided to give it a day and see what happened. Went into the family doctor the next day after I talked to my parents and we and he's like, I'm not absolutely sure this is your appendix. I think this is what it should be, but we have to have a CAT scan to make sure. They were backed up with the CAT scans that day. So we went to the emergency room, um, and the doc and the uh, radiologist tried to get the fluid. We, they found a bunch of fluid, and he said, I don't think this is your appendix. So they could not get any of the fluid because it was so thick. So then we went. Um, next to the gastro specialist doctor who performed an, uh, en uh, an endoscopy and a colonoscopy. He could see the mucus and, and that type of stuff and was concerned about it. 
he was also um, very honest and said, this might be cancerous. During the colonoscopy, it was a good thing we had that. We found um, several different um, polyps as well that we would not have found had we not done that. And, and I also told him I had a, um, some uh, sensations, some root sensations, as well as the pain in my stomach area. And then on the next thing, we went to a, a different radiologist out at that same hospital trying to get more fluid out. And the fluid was so thick, they still could not get the fluid out. And the next thing, um, uh, we got a call from that gastro doctor saying, which is the best thing in the world that could have happened to me, was saying you get an appointment set up with me and my mom and dad, me with that Dr. Lambert. <laughs> um, I felt very at ease and comfortable knowing this is what we needed to have happen. As we went in to meet with Dr. Lambert, we went over the test results. She said she was 99% sure that it was my appendix and um, the, uh, the PMP, my appendix in my um, spleen and my uh, ultimatum would need to come. Ultimatum would need to come out. Um, and she uh, in, and she in, in, and she uh, talked to us a little bit about the surgery, and she said it would take between eight and ten hours. And she said, "This is up to you guys how quickly you want to get this done." And I knew the longer we waited, the more nervous I would get, and the more <laughs> more worse it would become. So I said, "Let's try to get this done as soon as possible." So the next week we went in and we had that done. Um, I remember the, going in for the surgery, I was very nervous and very anxious. Um, they put the uh, um, epidural. epidural in my back to help out with some of the pain. And then I told my parents goodbye and I went in for the surgery. I can now remember my parents being in the room when I woke up after surgery. I was in a lot of pain, but sometimes it's hard to tell how much pain I'm in because I, I have um, such of a large tolerance of pain. <laughs> but she was 100% right. It was my appendix, my, spurn, my sternum, spleen. my spleen, and my uh, ultimatum. Um, and, she, and then we got me on the, uh, re, on the recovering end. I was in the hospital for about five days in, in the ICU. And the first thing I wanted to do was have um, a sip of water or a Coke Zero. She said, no, we need to wait about four days before any of this can happen. Um, but Dr. Lambert was very encouraging and very um, helpful throughout this process. She is my guardian angel. She is such an amazing doctor and the people here, without a doubt, put the patients first at this facility. Um, and she came in and checked on me two to three times a day. I had the, uh, the uh, student doctors as well who came and checked on me two or three times a day. Day five, I finally got to, um, I was on the ICU for five days because they found some um, fluid in my lungs. Um, day five, I finally got to go to a regular hospital floor. Hallelujah, I got water and Coke Zero is when I wanted it, after the ice chips, when I wanted it. <laughs> On the sixth day, I was moved to a regular patient floor, and I could eat pretty much anything I wanted to, and that was a good, good feeling for me as well. Um, I went home on the ninth day with oxygen. We thought I was going to be on oxygen for about a week. It turned out it was about two days afterwards. I mean, my oxygen was up to where I didn't need it. Um, and then it took me another few months, a uh, few weeks, you know, a few months to uh, recover and get my strength back. And I was very anxious to go swimming with some of my uh, friends this summer. Dr. Lambert asked if I'd just spend a few minutes and talk about Ryan's situation from a parent's or from a family perspective. So when we, Ryan first had the symptoms starting to occur, because he's had so many medical issues since he was an infant, both my husband Scott and I are like, what next can happen to this poor kid? He's been through so much. Um, we didn't really feel like that was very fair. Um, so as Ryan said, he went, we went to the gastro doctor. Um, we did the endoscopy and the colonoscopy. 
Um, he found some use in sales, and when he told us that it, there's a possibility of cancer, it's like, oh, we were just, you know, your heart just drops and you start thinking about the, the worst. I did some research on, on the internet, and as Dr. Lambert said, that's good and bad. Um, I didn't look at anything bad yet. So um, I had actually looked at the PMP before we went to Dr. Lambert, so we kind of knew some of the possibilities it might, it might be. Um, so we came to, to meet with Dr. Lambert, and as Ryan said, she said she was 99% sure that it was the PMP. Um, she, my husband said, well, how long is this surgery? And she said, it, it'd be about eight to 10 hours, and we about fell off our chairs. We were thinking we were headed for like a three-hour surgery or something, and it's like, oh my gosh. So um, I totally believe it is the mother of all surgeries. That's very true. Dr. Lambert was very reassuring to us when she was first talking to us, walked us through what the procedure would be, what would happen, what his stay would be like at the, at the hospital. We were very grateful that she joined the Huntsman Center. Um, we're very lucky to have her here because when I was doing some research and looked at where doctors were, they're, they're not very many very close. So, we feel really blessed that she joined Huntsman in January. Um, the week following, right, the week of Ryan's surgery, we did opt to have it as soon as possible. It got me out of a business trip, so that was good. Um, <laughs> Ryan kept telling his dad and I that he just said, I have a really good feeling. I think everything's going to be okay. I wished I always had his optimism and positive attitude because he's amazing with the things that he's been through that he just continues to stay positive and and looks, you know, each day is a new day. Um, I have to say the day of surgery was probably the longest day I've ever spent. <laughs> that is so hard to sit as a, as a family member to sit in the waiting room and, you know, you know Dr. Lambert said I'm gonna come out after we've done the surgical part and before, when they start the IPEC will come out and, and talk to you, but it's like, oh my gosh, it just seemed like it would go forever. And she was right on track. She told us about what time and, that was what time she came out, but sitting there waiting and then you start thinking, oh, something's gone wrong and, and it hadn't. So she came out and she said, yep, everything went, went as planned. She um, ended up taking exactly what she thought she would find in there. Um, the, the chemotherapy, the heated chemotherapy was about 90 minutes and then she went back in and did the, the close. Um, Ryan was such a great patient. He did exactly what he was asked to do. Um, he just pulls together and he doesn't argue and fight. He did, though, I have to admit, have a hard time with the water and the ice chips. He begged and begged, please, they're not looking, just give me a couple of ice chips. I said, Ryan, I can't. So he got to have the little sponge, but then I'd have to keep pulling it back because he'd try to suck on it. So we, we had kind of a hard time through that part. Um, so it was a very happy day when he finally got to have the ice chips and his Coke Zero and eventually worked up to where he could start having some meals. It was very humbling. The second day that we were in ICU, um, one of the gentlemen that works with me came to visit us and Ryan was pretty out of it still then. And so we were talking to Paul and he said, we were trying to explain to him what was going on and he said, oh, I know all about this. And I'm like, what? How do you know about it? He said his brother had passed away the year before um, from the exact same thing because they, for a year and a half, two years, they couldn't figure out what it was. And by the time they finally figured it out, it had spread so far that they couldn't really, he had some chemotherapy and it prolonged a little bit, but he ended up passing away. So we were very humbled by that and grateful that we feel like we were able to catch Ryan's early on and that he's in good shape. Um, he, has, he is pretty much back to normal now. Um, we feel through all of his hospital stays previous to this, too. Um, we probably built several wings of hospitals, I think. <laughs> um, he lost a lot of weight, which was really good. Um, Dr. Lambert said that was going to happen. Um, he had been losing weight before we realized what was going on, and it does take a while to get your appetite back. And he has a nice zipper scar now. <laughs> I think we figured about 44 staples, 34, something like that. So a lot of staples, but she did a great job. And we just want Dr. Lambert to know that she is our hero. Um, I, she's just such a caring person. Um, she was very honest with us all the way along. We got great care. 
And Ryan mentioned that everybody at the Huntsman Hospital was very caring, and they all do. They all say, is there anything else I can get you? Even Dr. Lambert was always asking, is there anything else I can get you? Can I do something for you? And you just feel like you're in great hands with people who really understand what you're going through and really care. So we just are grateful for Dr. Lambert and for her skill and expertise and her willingness to come to, to, to Utah and join the Huntsman Center. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan, for sharing your story. And uh, I can attest that uh, Ryan really, he, he really did. Whatever we asked you to do, you just did it. I know it wasn't easy, but, um, but that was a huge part of your recovery. So thank you. Great. So why don't we take a, a minute, is there, if there are any questions? Because we do have Dr. Wisnett, we have Dr. Alter. Yes? My first question is, when was Ryan's surgery? Oh, May 1st. So we started in February with him having pains, and then we had a couple of months where they were trying to figure out the gastro doctors what to do, what was going on. They had a couple of procedures. So it took them several months before they first. I think one of the lucky things that we had going for us was this gastro intestinal doctor was brand new and just come to go and practice his brother at the KD. And I think he must have went to a conference or something. That, why his residency, but he was well aware of this already. He didn't come right out and tell us that day when Ryan and I met him. Uh, he blew Ryan and I right away when he told him, I, I think this is cancer. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're both sitting there like, man, that's a tough thing to say right now, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and he assured, saw Ryan's reaction, he thought, I better back up and, you know, make him true. He doesn't know 100%, but uh, I just feel like we were really fortunate that that gastro had some experience of this. Mm -hmm. Did Ryan tell us he was swimming this summer? Swimming this summer? Did he tell us he went swimming this summer? Yeah, he did. He, he got kept, He kept asking Dr. Lamb, yeah. can I go yet? Can I go yet? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to wait another couple of weeks. But he got, yeah. he got some swimming in with his yeah. friends, so yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I have a question for Lauren. Did, um, yeah. Lauren. On the research you're asking to get out, uh, what kind of, I mean, we never heard, we hear about the grants and the research, but I, I've never seen much on it as, as, a, as it pertains to the results or what the findings were, what you learned. Yeah. Kind of so, Is there a place we can see that? Kind yeah, of? definitely. Well, so, why don't you, okay. okay. Yeah, so because it's on the video, so. Right. Yeah. So the question was, um, what are the results of all of these research projects that they're funding? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, we've definitely had a hard time sometimes getting the end results, and sometimes the end results aren't necessarily what at all we were looking for, and they plateau and then nothing kind of comes out of them sometimes but sometimes there are really good results and it's just a matter of following up with the doctors um, a lot of our research grants are international so um, following up with these doctors as I'm sure you can imagine it can be a daunting task um, but we do have some of our um, research grants and and results and information posted on our website I do have to say one research grant that we partially funded that's over in Australia has had uh, extremely positive um, kind of impact and we learned about it at SOGI um, with Dr. Morris. Um, it's about bromelain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. if you so want to talk uh, about it's, it. Uh, it's, uh, some of you might be familiar with this. So the group down in Sydney, Australia has been looking at injecting N-acetylcholine and bromelain into mucin and trying to liquefy it. And they proved this in, uh, in um, you know, in an experimental model. They proved it in, uh, not in an animal model, but they're starting to do it in, in people, actually. So they have a phase one clinical trial where they're injecting uh, a certain size of like a pocket of mucin and seeing if they can liquefy it. And so that's one of the studies that, which is actually, you know, very interesting. And in we're all kind of waiting to see how that's going to pan out and how generalizable it will be to use. And so... Uh, so that's one. I think another study that you funded um, was the one from Wake Forest, mm -hmm. where they yeah. did genomic studying. So getting back to what Dr. Wisner was saying is that you know we treat appendiceal cancer like colon cancer because it's kind of a close cousin. But what we're really starting to find out is that the genetics of these tumors are actually very different, very different. So appendiceal cancer really is a separate cancer from colon cancer, and we're only starting to see that now at the genetic, the DNA level. 
and that's one of the studies that ACPMP has funded too. So, so it takes a while, you know, you, you can see kind of the, you know, okay, we've shown this, well now what do we do with it, right? Um, so that's sort of, those are sort of the next steps, but yeah. So. Mr. Myers, I know you have a question too. Yeah, so from my, my own experience and, and reading, reading the literature, it, it seems clear that a, a huge problem in, in uh, trying to find out where this fits is the diagnosis itself. Coming up with a definitive diagnosis, uh, uh, clearly you can establish that there's mucin, you can establish that, a, that there were tumors, but uh, when, when the, the appendix is obliterated, when it's not there anymore, and you say, where the heck did this come from? Is it, what's its origin? And then the problem pathologic, or from a pathologist's point of view, all the pathology reports that I've read, there was always the big, uh, in big letter comment in capital letters, this is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the challenge is, is that it, it seems, just from my own experience, that because we only have 10 patients a year that show up in, in Utah with, uh, that are ostensibly diagnosed with this, that very few pathologists see enough of these to be able to do a competent differential diagnosis. And they're the, this is one of the most misdiagnosed, as, as people say about ovarian cancer, or mucinous ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. it's one of the most misdiagnosed uh, cancers that anybody knows about. And thus, when you look at the response rates for these, the response rates are always dependent on what was the diagnosis, mm -hmm. to, to segregate the responses in categories. But we don't even know that it was mucinous ovarian cancer. We don't even know that it was, uh, we're guessing, we think it may be, but we don't have any definitive diagnostic results, any pathological results to say, this is for sure, this. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the, and, it, and it's understandable that most of the energy would go towards cures, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of funding or process that is supporting both uh, improving the diagnostic process and secondly, educating more pathologists on how to do the best job with the tools they've got mm -hmm. to come to a more definitive diagnosis. I mean, do you have a, I mean, is there a response to that? Maybe from a pathologist. Yeah, moment. so Dr. Alpeter, do you want to come up? So, so I guess uh, to summarize the question, uh, you know, what, what are some of the challenges that you face as a pathologist and how do you try to uh, address those when you're, you know, looking at these cells under the microscope and we're not really sure where they're coming from? Right, so, so part of the reason I practice here is because our pathology department is an entirely subspecialized pathology department. So every single one of my geopathology colleagues did a one-year fellowship in GI pathology. And all I look at all day is GI pathology. Um, so I think even when I look at GI pathology all day, <coughs> diagnosis is difficult. If you extrapolate that out to general surgical pathologists, it adds on a whole other level of difficulty. Um, that's why whoever gets treated here, we have um, in place a procedure where all pathology from the outside gets overread at our institution um, before any treatment occurs as, for reasons exactly like what you're saying. Um, there are additionally, like Laura mentioned, the Wake Forest study that's going into the molecular aspects, that is a great way to start making a diagnosis, right? If we can say two different diseases are molecularly desperate from each other, then sure. we should probably be diagnosing them differently and treating them differently. Um, and we're just kind of getting into these um, high throughput genetic sequencing <coughs> abilities so that we can take a tumor and just look at a ton of di different mutations in DNA. And that's where we need to be to try to be able to distinguish one tumor from another tumor. It's, it seems though that when we talk about the problem of trying to trying to formulate an attack with a systemic approach. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that we don't, it's all apocryphal data. It's all yeah. guesses about whether, what this is and how it reacts yeah. based on a fuzzy 
diagnosis in the first place. We, we, we yes. think it might be, but it, maybe it wasn't. And then how do we segregate when we're, when we're trying to come up with was in fact it responsive or not? Yeah. And, and part of the problem too is that during all this fuzziness while we're trying to figure out what's, what's what, um, it makes the research aspect really hard because ideally you go back and you do a meta-analysis, right? So you look at a bunch of different research projects and you see what each different research project found in their smaller numbers and you can add that to be a larger number. And but there aren't any for this. But, well, there are, but it's been, the divisions are all different. Right. Right, because they have different names. And right. so how do you go back and add all those research studies together to make a really good, powerful one when you can't say A equals A? You know, A equals part of A and part of B lumped sure. together. Um, and so that is that is frustrating. Yeah. Um, but I think we're getting to the point, the, um, the American... Our, our, one of our big governing bodies just released a new edition, and for the first time, they actually included Lamins and Hammonds in their um, staging criteria, which is actually a really big jump. Because anytime a pathologist fills out a form, they go to a CAP staging criteria, and for the first time ever, just released last January, now in the CAP staging criteria, Lamin and Hammond is, is included in that, which makes it from now on possible to go back and look at all sorts of pathology reports and lump them together um, and, and kind of match things together now. Now that just started in January, um, but but it is, it's a big move forward to have the big governing body that every pathologist has to do, has to fill that out. And so and the other thing that Kai said mentions that, you know, until now it's been really subjective. I mean, we really rely on her looking at the microscope but it's drifting away from that, where it's being, becoming more objective, right? I mean, these, these, these genetic, we say genetic, we really mean it's DNA, it's not inherited genetics. But, you know, we used, they're getting cheaper and cheaper, faster and faster, more and more efficient. And we used to send these tests off four years ago and it cost $7,000, now it's probably $1,000, and in the next few years it's gonna be $500. And so, I mean, suddenly it's gonna be something that's easy to do, that we can do here, and you're going to have a, a, a spectrum of mutations that you can classify them that won't just be on Kaisa, what do you see, but it'll be on what are the mutations and how is this different from a different, and, and suddenly we realize that what we we're calling one thing is really four different things. Right, and then it doesn't matter what you call it. it well, because we know what it is. Yeah, because right? you know what it is. And also, there's more than 10. I mean, it feels rare, but it's not as rare as it seems. I mean. <laughs> Okay, so how many do you read a year? Well, Laura just came, so a lot more. <laughs> but no, I mean, seriously, since Laura came, I mean, how, how many surgeries do you do a week? And then now that we're getting all the overreads, too. So we get a couple yeah. a week now. We're, yeah. It used to be a a couple of months. Yeah. So, so Kaisa, you're, when you're looking at, so a year ago before Lara came, you were looking at 30 a year, yeah. and now you're looking at 200 a year, mm -hmm. 150 a year, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it feels really rare, but I don't know, Lara, what do you think? I think it's less rare than we think. It, it's it's definitely like, less rare. It it's, it's definitely less rare than we think. I, so, and, I, and that was actually the, one of the things that I was going to point out is, is also awareness, right? So it's considered so rare that it's on nobody's radar, but, in, and obviously in ladies, ovarian cancer is on everybody's radar. And so that's the most common misdiagnosis is that this is an ovarian cancer, right? Because uh, as I mentioned, these cells love to go to the ovaries. So ladies present with big ovaries, all this fluid in their abdomen, it's ovarian cancer, right? I mean, that's just what it is. Uh, and, it's, and it's easy to just go down that road because you're just not thinking about cancer of the appendix. But it, it is not as rare as we think it is. You know, that's one of the absolute mission of ACPMP is to raise awareness of appendiceal cancer so people are thinking about it and that, and that we become more thoughtful. So, for example, when we see a woman that, you know, usually ovarian cancer starts in one ovary, not both at the same time. And so if we see somebody who presents with mucin in their abdomen with two ovaries that are enlarged, bells should be going off. This is not ovarian, this could be something other than ovarian cancer. This should be appendiceal cancer and we need to look at that. And that's what we're trying to accomplish, right? So, but, but what, like what Jonathan was saying is when we get to the point where the pathology is really going to be driven by what are the genes telling us, then, you know, unfortunately, we should still be thoughtful, but, but we won't miss it as much, right? Because the, the, the genes will tell us this is not coming from the ovary. Yeah. So, can, so is there a process or, or can you put a process in place where just the thing you just said gets repeated 
which is if it presents in both ovaries and it, there's mucin present, golly, think about yeah. uh, it might be uh, appendiceal cancer. Because yeah, yeah. you're exactly right. And 75% even of the people who specialize in gynecological cancers will misdiagnose this. They can, you yeah. know. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase awareness. And again, as it becomes more, it, as, it, as we're recognizing that it's more common, I think that will happen less, less and less frequently, I hope. I want you, I want, yeah. <laughs> I, want to, I want to hear you shout it. We are trying to figure out how to um, engage the GYN oncologist to, to get them thinking about it as well. Does it happen here? Have you, I mean, with the, because there's a substantial community of, of oncologists, surgeons here, who deal with gynecological issues. Do all those guys, are they front and center about this? They're, no. they're pretty good. They're pretty good, they yeah. Have a pretty yeah. low threshold to say, you know what, this I might not be over. Yeah. that's not, really? but they don't say, they look, they're pretty good at saying, this does not look like something from the ovary. Yeah. They're and, not always going to say it's appendix. Right, but they're going to, right, and they'll come to us. And then they do a surgery to take out the ovary. Um, it's pretty standard that they send a frozen section during the operation. So they send us a little piece of the ovary sure. to look at under the scope. And as pathologists, anytime you see a mucinous neoplasm in the ovary, back to what Laura was saying, the appendix not, is not needed, right? So if they're, they're in the abdomen and we see a mucinous ovarian neoplasm, we say go take out the appendix too. Yeah. Like that's, that's just a blunt example. Right. Mr. Larson, did yes. you have a question? Any other questions? Hi, I'm Carmen. Yes. Um, my husband had this and he passed away in July. And we, so we've been at it for over six years. And uh, this is such a great thing right here that you guys are doing. I wish we could have done something like this in the beginning. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming tonight. And I hope you feel supported. And yeah, thanks for moving yeah. here. No. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for coming. Again, I, I hope you do um, leave here feeling like you're not alone, uh, even though this is, a, again, this, you know, this rare situation to be in. Please feel free to ask any of us uh, questions if, if you want to ask them, not in front of the whole group. Please feel free to eat the food that's out there. <laughs> um, and stop by and see the perfusionists, because they, they brought the perfusion, the pump over, and they can show you how it works. It's, it's pretty cool, actually. So. All right, well, thank you again, everybody, for coming. We appreciate it.